Well, hello, everybody, and how fantastic to see such a full room. Welcome, everyone, to the first of the IDS members' seminars for this term. And we couldn't be starting with a more exciting and important topic. So today, in a minute, I'm going to introduce our panel. Before I do that, I just want to alert everybody, because this is the first seminar of term, that we'll be recording this session. And when we come to discussion, if you want to say anything that you really, really don't want recorded, just say so, and we'll wipe that bit out. But so in addition to the audience in the room, we might well have people online and, and later on to hear what we have to say. So, for this first seminar of the term, we're talking about the Sustainable Development Goals, the UN Global Goals, with just, well, just over 10 years until they reach their, their deadline. Enormously important, in a way, setting the framework for development for all humankind and for our planet over the next period and beyond. 17 goals, 169 targets, but actually much more than that. I think what we've all come to realize is that we mustn't think of these as a set of separate goals as if they were silos. This is actually a package with all kinds of synergies and sometimes tensions between them. This is really setting a public, a political, um, a development agenda for all of humanity and it needs to be thought about as transformative. It's taking the world somewhere different. And it needs action. It needs action at an international level, at a national level, and crucially, locally as well. And the other really important thing about the SDG agenda is that it is universal in the sense of applying to everyone everywhere, not just to so-called developing countries, a term that we really have kind of moved beyond in IDS now. The SDGs are just as relevant to what's going on here in the UK and locally as it is to any other country around the world. And all countries are being required to report on their progress. And, and the politics and the activism um, around delivering on the SDG agenda is kicking off in all places, including here very locally to us. Um, so today, I'm really delighted that we're going to have a series of interventions from our panel that really cut across these, these different dimensions of the, the SDGs. So we're going to hear, first of all, from Sir Richard Jolly, and then from Carlos Fortin and from Stephanie Griffith-Jones, who are all emeritus fellows here at IDS, and they are all people who have a long trajectory of work in the UN system, and indeed have been part of goals agendas going back to the Millennium Development Goals, as well as now being very involved in the SDGs. And I think what we will get from the three of them is a really important set of perspectives on the international challenges and actually what it means to have a goals agenda um, of this kind. Um, we're then going to turn to um, a couple of other contributions to think more about the local end of the spectrum. And in particular, I'm really pleased to introduce Janet Barr, who um, was the, is part of the Lewis District Council and was in fact the mayor of Lewis last year and has been a pioneer of local SDG work in, in this area. She's also um, a development researcher doing a PhD at the Center for International Education, which is one of our sort of sister institutes that does development research on campus. And then I hope we're also going to be um, joined by Ollie Henman, who um, is a Liberal Democrat Party um, parliamentary candidate for Lewis, also involved in that local process, but was also part of the SDG summit um, last week at the UN, who I think can give us a really interesting perspective on, on, as it were, the politics of this process internationally and locally. So great panel. I'm going to try and keep these interventions to, I've been told, 12 minutes max, so that we have some time for discussion. Um, and so without further ado, let me hand over to Richard to kick us off. Thank you very much, Melissa. And um, may I give my own welcome to you all, a wonderful gang, gang from all over the world. And that's very much related to the SDGs. I want to begin with two people, if I can get this working, who aren't here. Dudley Sears, who was the first director of IDS, and Hans Singer, if you can see him, who was the first economist of the UN. And both were very much in the 
early spirit of IDS and I think would have been very much behind the SDGs. And this room, the convening space you'll see is known as the Sears Singer or is it the Singer Sears Room? Dudley Sears wrote long ago, we should ask three questions about a country's development. What is happening to unemployment? What is happening to poverty? What is happening to inequality? If two or threes are moving in the right direction, you could call it development. But if two or three of these are moving in the wrong direction, it would be strange to call it development, even if per capita income had doubled. And Dudley was, I'm glad to see people nodding. Very good. <laughs> That's, that is the spirit. We don't think in IDS of, oh, if GNP goes up, that must be good. How is it being used and so forth? And Hans Singer, when he was in the UN, wrote the preface, no, wrote the whole document or development as change for the first UN goal in 1962, actually, proposed by President Kennedy. And Hans said, development is growth plus change, social and cultural, as well as economic, qualitative, as well as quantitative. We meet in a room which, at least for me, but I hope for you, full of such uh, inspirations. Well, there are the SDGs, the latest goals, and as Melissa has said, the first time the UN has, has endorsed past goals that were universal, not just applying to developing countries over there, someone else's country, everyone. But they are by no means, come on, what do I do, please? The UN has set some 50 quantitative time-bound goals indeed since 1960. And a lot of people are very, oh goodness, there's the UN, yet more goals. No. All of the goals in, proposed were, came out of a process of long discussion debate, technically, politically with the governments and so forth. And when we did a UN history a while ago, we looked at how the goals had performed in terms of success, failure, and so forth. And a key point was, it doesn't make sense to say, well, if the goals weren't 100% uh, achieved, they weren't achieved. The issue is how much acceleration was there towards the aim of the goals, and, and, and. Four of them were most, five of them were mostly achieved. Majority have been considerably achieved. Few goals have slipped badly. The one I want to just, just underline was the goal agreed in WHO, the World Health Organization, in 1966, that smallpox should be eradicated from the face of this earth. I think most of you are too young to know, when I traveled to do graduate study, I had to carry a smallpox certificate showing I'd been uh, vac properly vaccinated. Two million people were dying a year in 1966, each year from smallpox. World Health Organization passed the goal. Smallpox was eradicated in 1977 a fantastic achievement, much written about it. How much did it cost to eradicate, you know? No, no sorry, <laughs> don't hesitate. It cost $300 million, 100 million by the UN, World Health Organization, 200 million by governments. What could you buy for $300 million in 1960s? Answer, three fighter bombers. And for that, smallpox was eradicated and no one now dies. No one has died for years. It's gone. Okay, let's come now to
the SDGs. There's different ways of clustering them, and Melissa emphasized that there's interaction between many of them. One way is the five Ps, people, prosperity, planet, peace, and social justice partnerships. There's another very good report by scientists that have just come out, fantastic document. I give you at the end the, um, the, uh, uh, the PowerPoint, not the PowerPoint, the, um, yeah, the reference to it. Um, well worth looking at, long but beautiful diagrams and so forth. People leave no one behind, prosperity, sustainable economic growth, full employment with sustainable consumption, planet, all the things needed, and now wonderful Greta Thunberg has really mobilized global attention to all the risks the planet face, peace and social justice and partnership. I'm not gonna go down the list, but there's the 17. I think these PowerPoints are all available. So if you want to go back and see the details, you can either go to the original UN documents or I've summarized them there. I want to underline inequality because that comes up linked to prosperity, but in fact linked to almost all the other goals. Reduce inequality within and among countries. And that has been one of the, now IDS has emphasized that, as I said, from the beginning with Dudley Sears, but it's been off the global agenda, off the agendas of many countries, and it's the inequalities of the world are creating massive problems, not just for poverty, but for sustainable growth and for many other things. There are the planet ones, climate, marine ecosystems, ecosystems, infrastructure, and as I've mentioned, peace and social justice. I want to end by just saying what I learned when I worked in the UN for 15 years for UNICEF. And we in the 1980s had set the goal of reducing child deaths by three million. In 90, early 1980s, 15 million children who are dying each year, many from readily preventable causes. And under the leadership of the uh, UNICEF director, we set the goal of reducing this in every country so that the total would be 12 million. And we did achieve it by 1990. And I learned a lot. I'm an economist. I thought, well, you need to have goals you need to have a good plan, serious, and government must have a plan, and you must probably bring in the private sector, and you need to monitor it. I learned so much from working with my, my non-economist fellows and with economists that to implement the goals, you need to have real priorities, national, but also local. And this key issue not brought in many times, mobilize awareness. And we did in a lot of different ways. We need to make sure, as Greta Thunberg has of the climate change issues, the other issues behind the SDGs, there needs to be a national, a global, a local process in every country to mobilize awareness. We need to build on the positive interconnections that's been emphasized. We need to decentralize responsibilities, so rarely brought into economic planning typically. We need to build coalitions for participation. And then monitor and regularly report progress. Again, well, I thought, yes, of course, economists say you must. When we started in UNICEF, many countries had no data on child mortality rates. It was calculated at that time, usually from census data, and censuses were taken every 10 years. And yet we were trying to mobilize action by 1990. It took us two or three years to develop a sample survey system that was reliable and would give us every year data in every country, 
on what was happening to child mortality rates. And you need to publicize successes. There's no good just having the goal and it's a technical matter. You need to mobilize opinion and sustain mobilization by showing the public we're making progress locally, regionally, nationally, globally. Thank you. Wonderful. And we can make some of these references available. We can make the slides available to you all. I think really fantastic to have that perspective from many decades of a UN goal experience and what we can learn for the SDGs now. Um, so I'm going to turn now to Carlos. I think you're going to stay here, who can give us again a perspective on, as it were, lessons from over time, but also particularly around some of these cross-cutting macroeconomic issues. Is that right? We're more, more uh, international uh, and, uh, and global. You need to speak into that. Is that right? Can you, yeah. Wave your hand because, if you can't. Yeah, that's right, if you cannot hear me. Uh, that uh, text uh, on the screen is taken from the uh, UN General Assembly Resolution on SDGs, um, and it summarizes very neatly uh, the consensus, international consensus at that time, you see, on the main pillars of development, which are on the one hand, development being the responsibility of developing countries themselves, but that means that they have to be allowed to decide on their own development model and have the policy uh, instruments necessary to implement it. And on the other hand, an environment, international environment, which is conducive and supportive of development, both in the sense of uh, opening up markets, uh, uh, flows of uh, investment and technology, but also the, uh, an international uh, uh, governance arrangement, which is multilateral, and that uh, uh, allows for the interests of developing countries uh, to be heard. Uh, and the SDG targets uh, uh, and goals uh, reflect that, you see. Uh, the bulk is, has to do with national and local action, but there are very important references to uh, the need for external support. Uh, these are some of the ones, I'm not going to go through them because they are there, but you can, you can see them. In, under every uh, uh, item, under every goal, there is some reference to the need for ex external support. Right? Um, and on uh, uh, goal 17, there is one that is particularly important, you see, uh, which is to strengthen the, the means of implementation and the global partnership and promote a universal rules-based, open, non-discriminatory multilateral trading system under the World Trade Organization uh, through the conclusion of the negotiations of the Doha uh, Development Agenda. That was the, the, the position in, in, in 2015, September 2015. Sadly, this position in October 2019 is quite different, unfortunately. The global environment surrounding the SGDs has deteriorated considerably. Uh, and what has happened is something I call Sorry, uh, an erosion of multilateralism. Uh, and I'll try and explain a bit what I mean by that, because it affects also. I mean, the two pillars are on the one hand, national policy space, and on the other hand, multilateralism and support. Now, the latter is being very seriously eroded, and as a consequence, the first one is also affected. Uh, the paradigmatic case uh, of um, multilateral erosion is, of course, President Trump's policy of America first. That's a quote from his speech at the United Nations now. Uh, the real uh, people leaders, the future belongs not to the globalists but to the patriots, right? By patriots he means somebody who is essentially trying to advance one's own country's interests uh, over and above anything else, right? Uh, and that, of course, is expressed in many ways. Uh, the, 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 the trade war with China is an example of that, obviously, but many other things too. And one important one, you see, is the way in which the present administration is dealing with the World Trade Organization, which for all its flaws, I mean, and I'm very critical of this, but at least it's a step forward in trying to introduce a truly multilateral rule-based system. And in particular, the system for the solution of controversies has been hailed as something as a, as a progress, right? Now, this present administration is very much against that. They've talked about even withdrawing. I don't think that will happen, but what they're doing is sabotaging uh, the, the, the system of controversy, uh, which uh, 
uh, by means of preventing the, the, the election of, uh, of members of the appellate body. Uh, if things continue like the, the way they are, by the end of, of the year, there will be only one judge in the appellate body out of seven, and the Chinese one. Uh, and that means that it, will stop, it simply will stop working it will be the end of, of that particular part, right? Uh, and of course, development has, has moved out of the priorities of, of uh, U.S. Uh, uh, foreign economic policy and foreign economic uh, trade policy. So that, that is very clearly a case of erosion. But one could say, of course, yeah, but fine, but Trump is not forever, right? Uh, and if there is a, <laughs> and if, if we have another administration, clearly a democratic administration, that will move back to multilateralism, but that's true. It will go back to having a, a multilateral view and, and a sort of liberal, uh, enlightened self-interest approach to American for, uh, foreign uh, economic policy. But there is another angle, unfortunately, you see, and that will not be solved right away, which is that the other aspect of the erosion of multilateralism, in my view, is the fact that there has been an effort, and this is more, this is, this is older, you see, it doesn't come with Trump, it precedes him. But there's been an effort to extend multilateralism, the notion of multilateralism, from the original one, which was really a way of, 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 of resolving uh, the differences and the relations among, among different countries and economies uh, in a multilateral way, to an attempt at introducing uniform uh, forms of economic and, and development policy, and in effect, a uniform model for the whole world. Uh, under the guise of introducing rules for trade, but it's being introduced are rules for other things, which, which reduce the scope of change and the scope of transformation of, in, of, of national governments. And that began with the World Trade Organization, and the emblematic example of that you see, uh, is intellectual property rights and patent rights, right? which have no place in, in By the way, I'll, I'll, I'll make a bit of a detour here, you see, because uh, this, this problem of, of trying to expand, trying to expand the, the frontiers, you see, of the international disciplines and rules applies not only to, to, to the right-wing uh, Trump supporters, but also to others, you see. And this is not Donald Trump, it's Barack Obama, who's saying America should call the shots, right? Uh, when, when intellectual property rights were proposed as part of the, of the WTO, there was a, ma a major effort at imp uh, preventing that from, on the part of developing countries, but also on the part of a number of analysts, including some of the most prominent defenders of globalization and free trade. Uh, and in fact, the, the, the paramount one, who was Jagdeep Bhagwati, known to Richard and to I as a nice fellow, but we're very much in a different position in terms of uh, 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 approaches, but he was very clear, you see, that, that intellectual property rights had no place there. You see, he says it's a cancer introduced and makes the World Trade Organization into a, a, a royalty collecting agency for the rich and for the pharmaceuticals, right? And that's exactly what was happening. Uh, and he, this is an interesting case, you see, because it exemplifies both the threats and the dangers, but also the possibilities of response, right? Because what happened is that there were some, some flexibilities introduced in the WTO uh, in favor of the right of health, as you were, you see. Um, and the government of South Africa in 1999, under, under Nelson Mandela, passed a law that expanded that a bit, allowed a parallel importation of, of medications from other countries uh, where uh, they already been patented, right? As a, res as a response to that, 39 from major international pharmaceuticals sued the South African government in South African courts, saying that there was a violation of the, of the WTO obligations, right? Uh, that, of course, was, was produced uh, anger uh, among the civil society everywhere, certainly in South Africa, but also elsewhere, you see, and particularly Oxfam and, and Doctors Without Borders were at the front of fighting against that. And there was a whole movement of civil society saying this is outrageous, you see. South Africa had 20% of the, of, the, of the adult population of South Africa was infected with HIV AIDS. Uh, and the medication were extremely expensive at that time. You see. And therefore, uh, the, the move by the government, which in any case was not a violation, I mean, it was quite apart from that. Uh, in effect, that, that mobilization um, was so powerful that the companies had to, had to withdraw. And they withdrew the case. It's true that part in, an important part of that was the fact that there was the, 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 the uh, 2000 uh, election in the United States in which the candidate to succeed Bill Clinton was Al Gore. 
who among his constituency, an important part of the constituency was people in, in the environmental uh, and health uh, lobbies, you see. So those put pressure on Gore, and he, he made clear that the US government would stop supporting the pharmaceuticals in their fight against, against, um, against the South African government. But the, 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 the onslaught continues, you see, and today the companies are trying to introduce something called linkages, which in effect prevents the, the emergence of generics uh, for a long time, you see. Uh, uh, and they are doing that not through the WTO, which is multilateral, but through bilateral and, and regional agreements, you see, because there they, can, they have much more of a, a chance to, to, to influence. So we are, we, we are, unfortunately, the SDGs are somewhere in between. Uh, what I say is the rock of unilateralism and the hard place of uniformity and homogenization. And the question is, what can be done about it? Because the answer is of some is to say nothing. See, this is the system, right? Well, I, I don't agree with that. I think that things can be done. And I think the, the example of the South African uh, AIDS uh, drugs is, is a good example, right? Uh, by the way, just in passing, uh, both of us are graduates from Yale University, and the Yale students were among the most vocal because Yale held one patent, one mm -hmm. patent, you see, in one of the, the drugs that were being that went right. No, I'm finishing now. So what can be done? Uh, I take this, this is from the, 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 the PowerPoint that you will see later, you see, about Lewis, a wonderful thing, you see. But the first point is at the end of there, you see. Never be distracted from fighting for national and global systemic change, above all. It's, also, it's all very well to say we can do a lot of things uh, for the SDGs locally and nationally but don't, 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 simply don't ignore uh, the parameters set by the system, right? So the first thing, keep in mind the global. Right? Identify systemic possibilities and flexibilities in trade, investment, technology, finance, and, and work to utilize them to the utmost. Uh, avoid the defeatist syndrome. Nothing can be done. Mobilize political will to change the system in a developing development direction. And, and here there are good proposals. This, this piece, this essay by Danny Roderick, a Harvard economist, I recommend because it's a good series of proposals on how, how to make the international trade uh, uh, regime more development friendly. Sensitize civil society to the essential link between the global, the national, and the local. And finally, exploit the possibilities of South-South cooperation which I think, particularly in the case, in the situation today, in which there are a number of developing countries, South countries as it were, that have reached a certain level of, of, of growth and development uh, that can make them interesting partners for South-South cooperation uh, to replace some of the more uh, conventional and traditional forms. Thank you very much. Wonderful. So we're getting this picture of these connections between the international, the national and the local, and also perhaps between what states and governments need to do, what perhaps businesses might and the market might do, but also the roles of civil society. And I think that's, again, a theme that's beginning to emerge from this discussion. So let me hand over now to Stephanie Griffith-Jones. Thank you very much. It's fantastic to be here, as always, at IDS, and great to have all these your students, I, I rather envy you. I think coming to IDS is a very exciting experience. Um, so I will focus more on the national, what can be done by governments, although I totally agree with Carlos on the need for multilateral uh, rules that are supportive of the SDGs, particularly also in my field of international finance, which is something that is going seriously wrong. But I will focus on the national and particularly on macroeconomic policies like fiscal and monetary policy because they can either enable the fulfillment of practically all the S uh, SDGs, which as Melissa so eloquently explained, are integrated, or they can make it more difficult. So macroeconomic policies are key for determining the space for achieving SDGs. Uh, whether it's uh, decent work, whether it's no poverty, uh, improving inequality, providing better health and education, or crucially, increasingly crucially, climate action, clean energy, green infrastructure. 
So for all that, we need to have an economy that is dynamic and that gives space for achievement of these policies. And one way of thinking about it is thinking about the contribution of the great British economist, perhaps the greatest economist uh, of the 20th century, uh, John Maynard Keynes, who taught us in a very prescient way that aggregate demand determines the level of employment, and that this level of employment is a key element for prosperity. And there is a no, what he argued is that the market doesn't do it on its own. There is not a natural tendency for national economies to go to full employment, so measures need to be taken. And he particularly recommended public investment. Because when private investment sees uncertainty, if there's a crisis or problems in the banking sector, they will not invest. And then if you don't act, you will have lower levels of aggregate demand, lower employment, lower investment in health and education, and so on. Of course, Keynes was writing in the 20s and 30s after the Great Crash, followed by the Great Depression, when output fell absolutely massively. And so there was a big step back. And there was an addition, and one thing that is interesting, because Richard talked about Hans Singer, um, is that Hans Singer was the second student that Keynes had to do a PhD in economics. So we have a nice link here. And the second great economist, less famous but also very important, Kaletsky, a colleague of Keynes in Cambridge and at the UN, added income distribution as a key variable. And he said that if employment and wages increase, output will rise because poorer people consume higher proportion of their income. So a better income distribution not only is good for equality, which is very important, um, as Dudley Sears said and Richard quoted, but it's also good for employment, investment, and growth. This has become very relevant also in the last 10 years uh, since the global financial crisis, which happened. It's not really a global financial crisis. It's a crisis of the North Atlantic. But because the developed countries think that what they do is the only thing that matters, they talk about it as the global financial crisis. <laughs> and this was caused by massive liberalization and growth of finance, basically since the late 70s, 80s, Thatcher, Reagan, with no corresponding sufficient regulation. And this led to many costly debt and financial crises, first in the developing world, Latin America, East Asia, Africa. And this, uh, the way these crises were handled was there was special interest given to the, uh, sorry, there was special emphasis given to the interests of the creditors. And very tough adjustment was imposed on the debtor countries. For example, in Latin America, we talked about a lost decade to development. Today, in the 80s. Today, we could talk about a lost decade for the SDGs. And our friend Richard Jolly was, was providing the alternatives, and he wrote a very good book with Francis Stewart and, and Andrea Corna called Adjustment with a Human Face. And there, there were two elements. One, the adjustment doesn't have to be so harsh. It can be more expansionary through good fiscal policies in particular to allow for more growth and more space to pursue um, better um, social spending and so on. But also any adjustment has to be done in ways that do not hurt, put the burden on the poor, but rather on the rich, for example, through higher taxation, rather than on social cuts uh, which put the burden on the poor. And so people believed that these crises happen in these silly developing countries that were badly managed, um, the smallest ones. But what happened in 2007 and 8 was that the crisis shook the largest your economy and the largest financial market in the world, the US, and then spread to Europe. And so they could no longer blame the bad governments of the developing countries, but maybe it was the fault of the excessive uh, liberalization and lack of regulation of financial markets. But returning to macro, the response was inappropriate, but especially in Europe, both in the Eurozone and in the UK. US under Obama actually pursued a fairly Keynesian policy, which led to quicker recovery, 
included, for example, investment in some low carbon in, in this growth of public investment, and especially very rapid decline in unemployment, which was almost very similar levels with Europe, but the, even though the crisis had started in the US, the unemployment halved, whereas in Europe it remained very high for a long time. Whereas the Eurozone and the UK followed austerity policies. These were imposed on the crisis countries, especially Spain, Greece, Portugal, with disastrous consequences. In Greece, GDP fell by 25%. Unemployment still today is very high. And at that time, half of young people in, in a so-called developed countries were unemployed in both Spain and Greece. But even worse, the creditor countries like Germany and Holland, which had uh, space to expand, nobody was telling them not to, had massive current account surpluses, low debt levels, also imposed austerity on themselves. And this had very negative deflationary effects on all of Europe and, of course, on the rest of the world, especially the developing countries. So their ability to grow and to have space to implement the SDGs actually fell. The exception was China, because China is a very large economy, and it pursued very expansionary fiscal policies, major public investment programs. In China, in one year, the, the amount of train mileage uh, doubled since the beginning of history um, in that year. This helped maintain growth in China, but also in the rest of the world. Of course, China has major problems, but it helped avoid a far deeper recession because it had this sort of Keynesian response and maintained fairly high prices of world demand and of commodity prices. Smaller countries, a small country in Africa, Latin America, or Asia has fewer options, but even there, national policies and national choices matter. Um, so even their governments can follow, for example, more expansionary policies, particularly in bad times, what Keynes called counter-cyclical, and design them so they protect the poor more and protect the environment more. And that will help most SDG targets. However, if they follow inappropriate macro policies, both in the times of boom, uh, but particularly they restrict in times of crisis, they will make it very difficult to continue achieving uh, SDG targets. So the framework is very crucial. Same with other policies, for example, industrial policy. If you have an industrial policy that you want to green the economy, you want to invest in renewables, you can achieve much more than if you just leave it all to the market and, and, and wait for them to do it much more slowly or not at all. So I would like to finish. Um, uh, the Catholic Church now has quite a good pope, and he actually has just endorsed the SDGs and done it in a way which is actually quite radical. That's why I like it. He says, as long as the problems of the poor are not radically resolved, by rejecting the absolute autonomy of markets and of financial speculation, and by attacking the structural causes of inequality, no solution will be found to the world's problem. Inequality is the root of social ills. So it's not just economists, but also religious leaders, which understand the need for very radical solutions, which affect both the structures of the economy and the short-term management. Thank you very much. Could I put down the slides up? Yeah, no doubt. So, um, finally, moving from national questions of, of macro policy and the framework within which countries might be trying to pursue the SDGs, I think we're going to move to the local end of the spectrum and hear from Janet Barr. Thank you very much, Melissa. These are all very good. We've got goals that are very ambitious, but how do they apply to Lewis? Lewis is you know, a very affluent, I love to say, it's an affluent town, but we've got an underbelly of poverty. Poverty that affects about 490 children who live in the town. And this is why for us, and as, uh, 
as you were saying the last week, Stephanie was saying, we need to, all of us need to just fight poverty um, every time. And that's what we are doing in Lewis. We first of all set up, now we've got a working party that specifically looks at the sustainable development goals and see within the town how we are meeting all these goals of the five Ps, people, prosperity, planet, um, uh, you know, working together, all the rest of it, all the five themes. We give grants to all these people who work within these themes. So these are examples. So for the first one, for the people, we've got community food growing and food banks. I mean, Lois got about nearly four and a half food banks uh, that have people who are struggling, living in an affluent Lois, come there every week to get, get food. Otherwise, they wouldn't survive. And I think there's something that the Pope might be, you know, outraged about, um, that people who are living in Lois are struggling with feeding themselves and their families. So these are all, I've got just five minutes, so I'm just gonna rush through. These are all the things that we are doing within the sustainable development goals. Uh, so the community, we've got people, so come to climate, we've got community renewable energy projects and all of those. So in Lewis, we've got our own pound called Lewis Pound. We've got Ivesco that works with schools providing um, solar panels for schools. We've got Lewis Electrical Car Show. Every year we do that, because we are very, very uh, outraged about pollution. We've got Friday food markets that people go to to buy cheap food. Uh, we've got sustainable, sustainability fair. We've got all sorts of things that happen. So you can see that in Lewis we are doing our best to meet all these goals. So these are all, you know, Continuing on, these are all the other things that we do that connect all these groups that work within the sustainability goals. And so we've got the recycling. You've got all these uh, renewable houses uh, that look critically to, to have resources that are environmentally um, acceptable uh, in, in building as well. You know, We've got biodiversity, we've got wildlife, and you're trying to, to make sure that they're all protected within the environment. So these are all the goals within climate change. And within climate change, um, I have set up with some group of people to work with schools to have one strategy about climate change that all the, the schools can use uh, in teaching that you know, include that into the curriculum. Because as Greta was going around, they were making statement action. But as adults, we need to take action and do something about it. So these are codes that reflect um, the standard development goals, and we're gonna read it. So, but this one, I would like to say, is how to save the planet. And uh, when you've only got from seven p.m. to 9 p.m. every first Wednesday of the month to do it. So this reflects those people who work within the sustainability. They are all voluntary workers. And they are not paid. But yes, they are put, doing their best. Uh, although the time is not enough, doing their best to change uh, the climate. So what do we do? What we are aiming to do is just focus on creating projects, not groups. So what I'm doing now is to get all of those groups together to have one sustainable group in Lewis so that uh, when the 17 goals were read by Richard, it's about how all of them connect and work together and maybe uh, get finance as well. Hopefully, this week, maybe next month, we are going to do an application to get about 2.6 million pounds towards all these sustainability goals in, in Lewis and in around, surrounding towns. Uh, so. What I'd like to highlight mostly is um, the fact that property, uh, pro we need to properly in integrate community groups into council-led initiatives. That's what I have done, to invite all of them, maybe get a chair who will organize all of these things so that we know what we are doing and check to see what we are doing and whether it's true or not. I mean, Richard will hold us to account. Um, anyway, so 
this is it. You can't get the, um, my time's up. You can't get all of these slides and, and, and go through. But importantly, it's not just about government. It's not about UN. It's not just about living locals. It's about all of you, all of us, you and I, doing what we can to change and meet all of these goals. Thank you. Well, I think we've heard a real spectrum here, and I think this bottom line is really a kind of trigger to what we might now want to pick out in discussion. If you remember Richard's slide at the very bottom, from what he'd learned of decades of goals in the UN, is that awareness is critical above everything. And I think one of the functions perhaps of local actions and local groups, whether they're in a relatively affluent but quite unequal town like Lewis, which I hope you'll all get the chance to visit at some stage, or whether they're in a small town or village in a much more resource poor part of the world. Um, I think there's possibly a role for action, but also for awareness building, which is coming from the bottom up matching up with and linking up with these initiatives that are led much more from the national or the global level. But look, this has been, I think, a fantastic panel and it's raised a lot of questions. I know some of you will need to move to classes at, at two. We can carry on for those who can stay, but in the time that we've all got, let's take a series of questions or comments or in fact experiences. It would be really good to hear from all of you, or some of you anyway, what do the SDGs mean to you in the areas you've been working in or where you're from? Um, and let's just take a series of reflections and then we'll come back to the panel. Please stay if you can. So anyone like to throw in a thought to begin with? Yeah, that would be great. Yeah, if you, yeah, and if you could at the same time just say which MA you're studying, because this is all very much a getting to know each other part of the term. So don't be shy. Let's take a whole series of kind of just quick interjections. What strikes chords with where you are? Hello. Hello. Is that working? Hi, Matthew Moores. Um, I'm a new student on the uh, Power, Participation and Social Change course. Um, yeah, the point I was just going to try and raise was the thing about data collection. My interest is in um, older people and development. And um, there's a, a concern that we're not capturing data on older people when we're looking at certain um, uh, projects and programs. So it's going to be, I think, quite difficult maybe to um, assess the success of the SDGs in 10 years' time if we're not um, collecting that data. I'm particularly interested in um, the participation of old, older women in projects. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to know what the, the panel thought about that. Thank you. Uh, my name is Sodam. I'm from South Korea. I'm in uh, Development Studies Master's program, and my special interest in SDG is actually gender mainstreaming. And I think gender mainstreaming means achieving gender equality. It being the like a common goal of all. And before starting studying here, I was in a struggle making that happen in the university community politics because I, when I was in the, in the activity I was doing, I received a lot of comments that why do I have, why do I have to be involved in this? Because I'm not a woman. I don't want my money to spend on this and I have to convince convinced them and it was very frustrating experience and so even outside of that university community on national level or international level how could we like achieve this to be our common goal Hello, I'm Stephanie Lida. I'm a visiting fellow here. And I was a bit involved, and I guess my question would probably be towards Richard in the monitoring or development 
of um, the Watcher SDGs and I saw a strong focus on monitoring and having worked in countries like India and Nepal, I have just experienced that this monitoring of the SDGs in the very specific terms um, are so detailed and such a technocratic and bureaucratic exercise that all attention flows into getting the numbers right rather than actual achieving change on the ground and having some structural changes we're talking about and actually focusing on implementation. And yeah, my it's just a comment or what do you think about that? Fantastic question. Anyone else from back here? Okay. Uh, mine is a concern that has also been expressed by I think the two speakers. Uh, who holds the state or the government accountable for implementing uh, the SDGs? Uh, from where I come from, Nigeria, I don't know if there is any monitoring mechanism to ensure that collectively we are doing what we are supposed to do. So mine, that is my concern. Thank you. Um, hello, my name is Juan. I'm doing the Master's in Development Studies. Um, so I have this question regarding the economic point of um, SDG. So I come from Colombia, and we were like uh, during the last couple of years doing this peace process. And at the same time, Colombia relies a lot uh, on petroleum, on oil. And in 2013, there was like this drop of the prices on oil. But then how do you deal like with the right policies if you want to like spend on peace, but at the same time you have to cut because the oil price went down. So yeah, that would be my question. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Santiago, I'm from Mexico. Uh, I study the MA of Governance, Development and Public Policy. Uh, so before coming here, I was uh, also working in a private consultancy firm uh, regarding sustainability. And a lot of enterprises and private uh, the private sector take the SDG as, SDGs as uh, flagships and a little bit of a marketing strategy for, for their own efforts. So my, my question is, how do you, well, there, there's this tension about the smooth transition into, into real structural solutions and contributing to the SDGs in whatever minimal or incremental way they can do it. So my question is, uh, how, how do you approach this, this problem? Let's go in the other direction then. So just a um, range of questions and thoughts there. Pick up on whichever you think are most relevant to you, Janet. Oh, hello. I pick on what this lady asked about women and sustainability. Last year, I mean, we need to, as women, that, that's a, you know, quite a good question. Even here, and I, going back to what this lady said in, in Nigeria and in most African countries, women are leaders. I mean, in, in our houses, can, can you hear? In our houses, we lead. So it's very, very important that we, we own as women, we own all these sustainability goals. But how do we do that is your question. Last year, I had 100 girls in Lewis, again, so I'm using all Lewis examples, 100 girls to come and articulate their hopes, wishes, and aspirations. And for that, I invited people you know, from House of Laws and House of Commons to come and answer all these uh, issues that relate to women and their um, you know, uh, development. That's what we need to do. We need to take action, and the way we do it is to just demand it and set the agenda. Otherwise, nothing will happen. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, excellent questions. I want to maybe just compliment a little bit on gender equality, if I may, and then talk about um, Colombia and commodity prices. Um, so I just wanted to say that at the national level, you, there's a lot of action that you can take. For example, there are groups working on engendering fiscal policy, how to have mechanisms within fiscal policy that allows for greater equality for women, equalizing wages, for example. And there's a whole gender fiscal group which evaluates policies from that perspective. So there are specific tools that can be used. Um, but what I do want to talk about is Colombia. What do you do when you, for example, need to spend more money 
and at the same time, your, your price of oil or, or your main exports are falling, whether it's cocoa, coffee, oil, or whatever. And I think um, what you need to do is you have to do it before. You, in advance, you have to follow what is called by Keynes countercyclical fiscal policies promoted by your fellow national, Jose Antonio Campo, for example, who, um, you, and Colombia, in fact, has a stabilization fund. So in good times, you save money. You don't spend, the government doesn't spend it all. And then in bad times, or when you have a need, you have the resources so you can expand uh, government spending and continue the investment process. Because one of the things that really is bad for the SDGs is when governments are under pressure of a crisis or a fall of commodity prices, and they cannot continue the, the absolutely, absolutely crucial investment in housing, in education, in health, in, in environment, which is essential. So, but if you have these reserves, you can then later, in the bad times, also, also continue spending. So th there are tools. There is not a need to just uh, you know, panic. There are always alternative economic policies. It was Mrs. Thatcher here who said, Tina, there, are, there is no alternative. Well, there are good yeah. alternatives. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Stephanie. Carlos. Yes, uh, also on Colombia, uh, just uh, complementing what uh, Stephanie said, uh, the real solution you see, is to get away from uh, dependency on a particular individual commodity. You see. Uh, there is a whole theory about the resource curse uh, the fact that countries which are very rich in natural resources end up being very underdeveloped because the, the, the presence of that resource makes uh, for problems in the economy. Uh, the, the most talked about is so-called Dutch disease, uh, which uh, is, is the case of, of Holland, you see, which, where because of the impact of the oil uh, uh, emergence uh, and on the exchange rate, the whole economy went up to spout. Right? So the, the long-term solution, evidently, is to try and get out of that diversify, use the resources that the, the, the natural resource uh, generates uh, to diversify the economy. That obviously is not easy, it's not easy. Uh, and there are also ways in which the, the, the very uh, abundance of, of easy resources coming from natural uh, sources uh, uh, makes it difficult. But that's a long-term thing. Uh, the short term is the one that Stefan is talking about, obviously, is to have some kind of a, a, a compensatory uh, uh, fund, right, and the Norway, does that. Um, Chile has it too, right? And Colombia too, for that to some extent. The question, of course, is, is it's not easy to, to set it up. There's always the, 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 the temptation of using it, you know, laying hands on what has been accumulated for purposes other than the, the original purpose. But the combination of the two things, you see, short-term uh, counter-cyclical uh, policies and uh, uh, long-term diversification policies should be the way out uh, of this dependency. Yeah, thank you. Um, a comment on the old issue, the, the, uh, where do older people come into this? Um, I give you a reference, a book called Extra Time, because the populations in virtually every part of the world are growing older. Um, most of you don't face those issues, I've been extremely interested in them for rather obvious reasons. And the challenge to end up with a slogan is, are you going to be young old or old old? And the book Extra Time gives a lot of research evidence on what leads to um, people being young old rather than old old. And of course, I think that can and should be brought into the SDGs. Uh, on this, the very interesting questions of uh, oil and petroleum, one, um, some of you may wish to look at the, what your fellow students wrote in 1975, I think, when they went to Scotland, when Scottish oil was just being discovered, and wrote an IDS discussion paper on what to do. There's a great example of the good ideas that came out of the students, many linked to what Stephanie and Carlos have just been saying, which Scotland and the British government didn't follow, unfortunately. So the money was splurged on consumption. 
finally, um, I was like that reference to the consultants and so forth. And I passed round um, a paper written by consultants on what Bristol, the town in Britain, has been doing. I think what consultants do at the local level, very interesting, very important. And who has ever got that paper, please return it at the end of the seminar. Thank you. Just a quick point I'd like to add. I think these, these points about commodity dependence are really important, but of course there's a whole new layer of addition around the problem of oil and fossil fuels now, which is that if we're going to have any chance of meeting any of the environment related and the climate action goal, those fossil fuels have to be left in the ground. So um, it's, the, the problem isn't just that you're dependent on one resource, you're dependent on a resource where if the macroeconomic framework follows what the science is telling us, those resources should become what's known as stranded assets and actually not exploited. And that raises a whole set of questions about whether countries are prepared to buy into a rules-based system which says actually we stop subsidizing or we stop exploiting fossil fuels. So um, I think there's a really important set of questions there. I'm just wondering if anyone on the panel wants to pick up on the very important point I think that was raised about, um, about monitoring. And if the, I mean, or if there's anybody else would like to contribute to what I think is a very important debate about whether the kind of monitoring systems are actually bureaucratizing the SDGs in a way that takes away this fundamentally political spirit which needs to motivate people to take action. Um, and the question was raised, I don't know if there's anybody else in the audience who's got a comment on perhaps on how they see the monitoring going on in their own countries. Monitoring can be a very important tool for accountability, but actually um, does it help in taking forward a more transformative agenda? So maybe anyone who wants to speak to that or another point, let's take another round. I'll come to Joe at the back, but did you want to come in here? On? Yeah, I just... Yeah. Uh, hi, my name is Hamza, I'm from Saudi Arabia. I just wanted to reiterate my colleague's question about uh, the importance of data and um, uh, how we can use data to see if the SDGs are being met or not, especially with kind of ambiguous goals like the no poverty, the first goal, and kind of just making sure that um, we're not just depending on censuses and making sure that the most marginalized in society are also being taken into consideration, especially in like countries like Egypt or other countries, Africa, South America. Thank you. Hi, my name is Jo Howard. I'm a fellow here at IDS in the Participation, Inclusion and Social Change Cluster. Um, it, it kind of follows on with that perfect segue with what you just said, actually. I think from um, our perspective and our cluster and the work that we do, um, that if we want to monitor meaningfully progress against the SDGs, we need to be engaging with the poorest and most marginalised and finding ways in which they can, can build that data themselves and own that data and interpret those goals. Because, they, again, they're being interpreted from the global to the national and then national downwards. And what does poverty, what does inequality, what does inclusion mean from the bottom up? So that's one thing um, around monitoring. And I'd like to link that I kind of to a question back to the lady from Lewis. Lovely to hear about these initiatives going on. But I'm really, I've been wondering about that question about projects, not groups. And I think that part of what we need to be doing is building, building coalitions. Maybe it links to your second one, how you can link groups into institutions, how you can create spaces for collaborative working around the SDGs. I think this is fundamentally important, and if we're going to link the, the local to the national to the global. Uh, thanks. I'm Jaydeep. I'm a fellow here uh, as well. I'd, uh, Melissa, I just wanted to expand your question to northern context as well and ask the panel, and perhaps yourself, you and Melissa, what the usefulness politically speaking, is of the SDG framework in, for example, calling out the anti-poor austerity agenda here in the UK. Uh, and if there is a role for that, what we as development professionals, or we as a development institute, what our responsibility is on focusing on what the anti-poor uh, actions of governments here uh, and their impacts. 
Hi everyone, my name is Jennifer Uchindu and um, I'm an MA student, Development Studies, and I'm from Nigeria. So following on to what um, she said on monitoring, so the work that I do back home, I work a lot with the SDGs, trying to sort of like a watchman on what government, private sector, what they're doing in terms of the SDGs. And then I've realized that there's no one size fits all on how each sector and each field should report and how the monitoring should work. So a good example for us is the banking sector in Nigeria. They have the sustainable banking principles, which they work on and they must report on how, they, how they're working on each SDGs in their reports. So it's mandatory for them before they can get approvals from the central bank and all of that. We don't yet have that for the FMCG group, but it's been worked on. It's been worked on for the investment group. So the um, the national, um, what's it called? The stock exchange now has a set of um, the set of not checklists, but you have to report on each of them before you can get approvals and all of that. And then I've realized that in Nigeria, on a national level, there's a lot of, um, let's just tick the box, let's just say we've done this. And it's wrong because you can hide under the umbrella of the SDGs. If you say you're working on the SDGs, you need to break them down. What are you doing on poverty? What are you doing on climate change? Because recently at the Onga, Nigeria um, put out this um, really nice publication called SDGs. It's called integrated SDGs. So what they're doing is to integrate the SDGs in each of the ministries. So the fiscal policy, the women um, ministry and all of that. But I asked the question, you should have done that with climate change because climate change cuts across each of the ministries. It's a security problem, it's a poverty problem. So you have to start with like localizing the SDG with that particular word. What are you doing with that particular SDG that you're working on? Because I don't think every country can get all the SDGs, it's too ambitious within this time frame that we have. So if you're working on your country's um, particular issues, for us it's poverty, it's unemployment, it's issues of climate change and then goal 15 and goal 17. So why don't you work on those and then put all your strengths on, on those basically. So those are my thoughts. Yeah. talk about the national the national context and how some of these local initiatives link up and then others on the, the monitoring points. I'm just going to comment on the ladies uh, respond to what the lady said. Um, this coach of a uh, focus on um, projects not grouped. That means that we tend to uh, groups tend to protect their own. They become so protective. My aim is to get all the groups together as one, so that we look at the projects themselves, but not the groups. So groups together as one, uh, that's the meaning. But when it comes down to the monitoring, and as the lady highlighted, I think we need to, these goals has to be, uh, we have to prioritize them to contest, because every contest is different. So that's which why I'm giving Lewis experience. It's contextual to Lewis and what's going on uh, in Lewis. Our aim is eradicating poverty as well as climate change. That doesn't mean that we are not working with the others. We are working with that. But these are our top uh, ones, the top ones that we are seriously looking at to eradicate poverty and housing. With housing, we are pushing all those uh, national policies. I mean, we've got the neighborhood plan. Neighborhood plan within the Localism Act 2011 allows every town to come out with their own neighborhood plan. That looks within the sustainability goals, everything. And that's what we've done. We have a referendum, we identified what is needed. And we need houses, that's what we are doing. And we are monitoring that, working with the district and, and the uh, East Sussex County Council, and as well as the government. So my role now, we are going to change. As chair of the Sustainability Working Party, we are going to have a way to link into, into the national the national lead, so that we link that come, you know, to lowest, to the local, and then the bottom up, like Melissa was saying. Uh, that's the only way that we can monitor, and that's the only way that we can progress. Okay. Great. Stephanie, you can say something about the, the UK national context? As well, yeah. 
Great. And also, if I may, something to elaborate a bit, your excellent point on stranded assets. Um, so on, on the national, I think, I mean, I was lucky enough to work with Dudley Sears, and he got me involved in the discussions about Europe. For example, the European periphery. In fact, he was really quite almost prophetic because he wrote that there was going to be a problem about integrating the European periphery. And the countries that he named and that he studied were uh, Greece, Spain, Portugal, and Ireland. And those were the countries that were then so severely hit by the crisis. So he, 20 years before, understood that, we, that issues of core periphery weren't just in relation to developing countries, as, as Singer and Prebesh had written and others, but also within Europe. And this, this brings me to the fact that these, these discussions that we're having about austerity, they may have started, well, they started in the 30s in, in, in Europe and in the United States, uh, and, and, and the big role that Roosevelt played. But then they moved the last 10 years to the UK and to the Eurozone, as you rightly pointed out. And the fights of austerity have been as tough, maybe not so dramatic because people are not so poor in Europe, but there are poor people here as well. And, and there are a lot of parallels. And also, I think it leads to a certain humility intellectually, because there used to be this view that people in Washington and in London and Brussels knew everything, and that they would, these experts would go, so-called, would go to the developing world and tell them how to do. For example, how to liberalize your financial system. And they, they still try, but then people in Africa say, oh, you want us to have a big crisis like you had? So, so we have to have this modesty and, and learn both from um, uh, developing countries, learn from developed, but also the other way around. I wanted just very quickly to elaborate on the very point, very good point you made, Melissa, about stranded assets. Um, I think this would, for example, in the case of Colombia or some of the Middle East countries, require a major effort of structural transformation so that you increasingly rely on for your exports on goods and services that are not in this category of stranded assets. So you will need a, a very strong industrial policy. You will need to channel funds from the surpluses that you have of exporting these goods, long-term surpluses. Um, which is, for example, what Norway does, you will need to channel them through public development banks, through the private financial system, to have major investments to go into other sectors. Because you know that in 20 years' time, nobody will want your oil or your coal. Colombia also has a lot of coal. And one interesting thing that the country where I grew up, like Carlos, is Chile, they export copper. So they're talking now about green copper which means that the energy, uh, the energy use, the electricity used for extracting the copper is coming from green energy because it's in the area of the north where there is the best sun in the world because it's a very dry desert. And so they are using solar energy to power these mines. So they're trying to even green some products. So you can either move out of certain products out of oil, out of coal, but you can also try and green more, if it's feasible, the production of certain products. Of course, you can't do that with oil because oil is just carbon intensive. Um, but I think there's, you know, there are, as you mentioned right at the beginning, Melissa, there are important trade offs because these countries like China, India, South Africa rely heavily, for example, on coal. So you have trade offs between uh, making them far more sustainable ecologically, at the same time delivering um, energy to poor people. So there are important trade-offs, which uh, are, of course, uh, an area of important uh, study. Yeah. Okay. Carlos, you Thanks. Yes, I'd like to say something about uh, data and monitoring. Yeah. Yeah. Because we do have a problem uh, with the SDGs, unfortunately, uh, unavoidable. Uh, the ADGs essentially is a, what we could call a political economy exercise. It's an effort at looking at the global society and the national society as a whole, as an integrated whole, and ask how that can be changed in a positive direction. So it, it, it has a number of elements which are not quantifiable. You see. 
uh, easily. But then it's expressed through goals, which are quantities. So the temptation is really to, to fall into the latter, you see. Simply say, well, let's, let's look at the, at the numbers, you see. Uh, when I was at Yale studying, yeah, there were my colleagues of mine who were, were looking for a, a, a topic for their dissertation, their presentation. And the, the, the way of doing it was to say, what kind of problem can lend itself to this particular econometric uh, method? And for which there is enough data, numbers, you see. So it was a case of saying, the important thing is to use numbers, is to crunch numbers, right? And then the, 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 the issue is becomes secondary. Now, that's unavoidable. The goals are goals, you see, and I think that should be the starting point, obviously. The important thing is not to stay there, yeah. right? First yeah. of all, rec recognize that the, the data are always, always unreliable, right? I mean, there are cases in which it's, it's blatant. In other cases, not so, not so much. But you, you're always uh, uh, treading on very, very difficult territory when you're moving, uh, when you're talking about uh, uh, national uh, economic data. But secondly, even when it's reliable, it doesn't tell the whole story. You have, to, you have to go into other things, and fortunately there is an increasing number of, 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 of ways of approaching uh, qualitative data gathering and data processing, which can be useful, you see. Uh, so let's not fall into the trap of the statistician. He has to be a, a, a tool for our work, not the one who dictates our priorities. Very good. I think uh, Dudley Sears would have, who was essentially a statistician, uh, I think he would have emphasized that. I wanted to just speak to the Saudi Arabia questions um, a little more. I've remembered one of Dudley Sears' early articles, The Life Cycle of a Petroleum Economy, and it would be worth uh, looking, that, uh, looking that up. Um, and um, perhaps if this, it, I'm wondering whether to mobilize uh, Carlos and myself and one or two others. You know, there's nothing wrong with, in the evening, having a little seminar on Saudi Arabia. Uh, and just uh, having Dudley's article, The Life Cycle of a Petroleum Economy, looking at the Saudis recent saying we must encourage tourism. And IDS has written some interesting things on the costs and dangers of tourism. <laughs> There's a lot of costs and dangers on more or less every, everything, but that's one thing. I'd be happy to join in that. Um, I wanted also to mention, um, which uh, Stephanie almost has, Dudley Sears, after he ceased to be director, stayed on in IDS, and we, we would have all died had he not. He said, I'm no longer going to work on countries over there as opposed to problems of economics in our own backyard, as, uh, as um, Emmanuel de Cat once put it. And he did. He worked on underdeveloped Europe for 10 or 11 years until he passed. Uh, so the universal agenda is very good. No one has mentioned, and this is um, if Mick Moore was here, the issue of tax, the issue of corruption. Big issue. I hope um, you'll all hear Mick Moore at some point during uh, this year because he's done a great deal very practically on the tax side and I think on the corruption side. Um, and finally, uh, Janet, if you're willing, um, we could have a little tour of Lewis, which I've done several years. And when we get round to that, and it won't be too long, We'll, we'll pass around on the website or direct, and you can sign up perhaps uh, 20, 25 people at a time, and you could see Lewis. It's a wonderful town. It's also a revolutionary town, dare I say. And Tom Paine, some of you may have heard of him, and this Sussex, this Lewis pound note has on it a quote from Tom Paine. We have it in our power to build the world anew. Yes. Listen, I think...
I mean, Richard has almost given us a wonderful final word on, on this, and I think we probably need to now peel off, but just a couple of things I wanted to say in conclusion. I think this has been a rather wonderful first member seminar, partly because what you've seen here also is something of the history of the debates that have been going on in IDS for decades from some of the people who've been involved in them and yet are still here and contributing anew and afresh to some of these ideas. So in a sense, I think we have so much to learn from the past. Many of the ideas that have been around for quite a long time in development and where IDS has been pioneering are constantly being reworked and they need to be reworked. And you as new students are part of the ongoing reworking. But um, I'm really glad that you've, you've seen this kind of history a little bit al alive and well. Um, some take homes for me from today. Um, I absolutely love, well, I don't love, but I think the way Carlos put this around the SDGs being stuck between um, the rock of unilateralism and the hard place of uniformity. I won't forget that. And I think it points to this sense that we both need a global collaborative agenda, but yet countries need to find their own way. And I think this theme of there isn't a one size fits all approach has come out in some of what, what you've said. And in countries taking their own way, they also surely need to be learning from each other. So in response to Jaideep's question about the UK, we've heard a great deal about, well, one initiative locally, and there are some others um, around. I think the UK has been quite disappointing, um, certainly our current government, um, in linking up the serious problems we have of poverty, of inequality, of, of lack of action on climate change with the SDG agenda it hasn't really done it. Um, and yet, if you look across the political spectrum, just last week in Brighton, um, linked to the, the opposition party conference, the Labour Party conference, there was a really inspiring set of meetings on the world transformed which was talking about new transformative visions for a future around ideas like a Green New Deal, um, like investments in um, both employment and poverty reduction and greater equality. So some of those things are happening, but they're very wrapped up with, with quite oppositional politics at the moment in this country, which I think is probably, probably the case in other places as well. And meanwhile, I think the UK is quite guilty of, of dividing things up into bureaucratic silos. If you look at our own voluntary national reporting around the SDGs, it's been nowhere near Nigeria's, for instance. It's been very much about can we tick off a few things we're doing around health, a few things we're doing around, um, around gender. And it hasn't had this, this cross-government push that I think we need to have. So the UK, I think, has a great deal to learn from other countries um, around its national reporting as well um, and finally I've I've really liked this seminar for something that it's brought out which I think is really critical to the way we work at IDS which is this linking up of global and national agendas which are around rules and policies and decisions and so on with the energy the social energies that come from the bottom up from communities from different people from diverse groups often those living in poverty and marginalization which can give us um, sources for hope, seeds of change, different ways of thinking about issues and often quite radical alternatives. And if the SDGs demand anything, they demand a transformative agenda that is both top down and bottom up. Um, and if you over the course of this next year can help to contribute to some of that agenda, I think your time at IDS will have been really well spent. So thank you all very much for your contributions today and thanks to the panel. <laughs> <laughs>